of our next panel discussion is how to connect startup resource to explore global market. HCOs and leaders of companies are generous enough to come to the stage and share with us their precious experience. First, let me introduce our moderator of this session, Dr. Stanley Huang, Deputy General Director of CIS. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our moderator. And now our panelists, Mr. Tom Strabag, CEO of Strabag and Company Limited. This is a very special session because our moderator and our panelists are all CEOs and leader of companies. They'll be sharing their expertise and their precious experience. Welcome. And our panelists, Dr. Liu Da Takeda. Dr. Takeda is the president of Leave a Nest America. And Mr. Bin Luo, CEO and resident of Microsoft Accelerator Beijing. Mr. Luo, welcome. And Mr. Andrew Tan, founder of Think Big Venture. Welcome. And Mr. Richard Tan, CEO of InnoSpace. Mr. Kevin Yu, founder of Taiwan Accelerator. Last but not least, Mr. Christophe Penetier. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Uh, partner of School Lab. All right, ladies and gentlemen, again, your applause welcome our panelists and moderator. Okay, thank you all. This is the final panel for this today's event. And uh, I'm the Stanley Huang, the CEO of the Triple. And Triple is a matchmaking platform try to bridge the global startups with the Taiwan's manufacturing technologies. So today we have seven panelists to discuss the very interesting topic, the connect startup resource to explore global market. And all of our panelists are the accelerators because when we're talking about a startup resource, uh, we will always consider it's a startup ecosystem. And uh, in the ecosystem, accelerators always play a very important uh, role because they can help the startups to broaden their mindset and the skill and even to get some funding from them. So, Today, I would like to invite all our panelists, first of all, to describe their accelerator program, how they help their startups for the global market. Maybe from my left side, Tom. Hi. Um, my name is Tom Strodbeck, and uh, I'm the CEO of a company called Strodbeck & Company that's based in Liverpool in the United Kingdom, and I want to thank uh, the organizers of the event uh, for having me here, um, many of whom uh, I've known for many, many years. Um, as to what I do, a little bit of uh, background, I suppose. In 2005, I had just finished running my, my first company, which was a training and development firm that was based in Ohio in the United States. I joined um, the team of an international network of business incubators. Uh, called NBIA, and in fact, that's when I met uh, people like Hank and some of the programs here in Taiwan, met folks from IIII, eTree, uh, the SciSoft Center, and uh, some of the really, really excellent programs that are done for entrepreneurs and in Taiwan. And from 2005 to 2015, I worked with international networks. I did training and development for people who ran uh, uh, incubation centers, which is what they were called in 2005. And in looking back at that time, um, that 10-year period was, is one of the most exciting periods of time in entrepreneurship. Uh, and many of the things that you talk about at uh, Computex, Innovex, and things like that came about in that decade. It's really, really kind of amazing. Um, for example, in 2005, we really didn't talk about accelerators because there was only one. Uh, y Combinator, which launched in 2005. 2006, they were joined by Techstars. 
many of the terms you use uh, when you say pivot or iteration, you didn't say in 2005, because no one talked about it then. That came out of Eric Ries's book, the, the Lean Startup, which is 2009. You may have talked about MVPs, uh, because that was uh, Steve Blank's book in 2002, uh, which really I kind of think is the foundational book of how startups organize today. So that all happened during my career, and part of my responsibilities was to interpret that uh, for people who were working with startups to, to, to help them grow and to help them uh, with the concept of failing fast. And as time went on, we accumulated more tools. Many of you are familiar with the Business Model Canvas. Yeah, the Business Model Canvas 2012, and so on. And all that strategy uh, we try to interpret and dis distribute to a network of about 800 programs in 62 different countries. So it was a great experience and it helped me build out an international network that can, could be tailored to a specific technology vertical or a, a specific market. Now one of the things I did, and it's relevant now, I, I'll save that for later because that that's a question you're going to ask me. What I do now is a couple things. One is I still work with the leaders of business incubators and accelerators. Uh, though I live in the United Kingdom, uh, I'll work with folks in the United Kingdom. I also do a lot of work in the Middle East and, and in Asia. With entrepreneurs, there's a lot of mentor support um, out there. Some of the mentor support isn't quite that good yet, but one-on-one -on -one support for entrepreneurs is often very available to them. What I do through my program in Liverpool is try to identify different partners specific to the needs of a, of a given technology. Uh, there are a lot of different destinations for uh, international companies and some of them make immediate sense. I suppose if you're a if you're a fintech company, there's an immediate sense to look at London, for example, as a destination. For now, that might change in the next two years. I know Paris wants that, but for now, we're thinking London. But in other cases, there might not be an obvious destination for the technology. And I'll give you an example. It was a, a company through uh, an accelerator in Egypt. It's actually a network of accelerators called Flat Six Labs. And, they're in uh, Jeddah, and I think there's a flat six in Beirut, but there's six different flat six programs. There's one in Cairo. And they had a technology that sensed um, whether or not a dairy cow was sick. And it was an infrared technology, put it up in a milking room. It's kind of cool, actually. It's how it worked really well, too. That was a cool thing. So how do you take that to um, the United States, which has a very large dairy industry, and which is the biggest dairy state in the United States? Anybody know, by the way? You know, you probably don't. I mean, if you're from the U.S., you'd say Wisconsin, but that's not true. It's actually California. Um, but Texas has a large dairy population, too, and I happen to know both researchers, commercialization experts, legal experts, and so on, in a network of, of programs in an area, and that's what I try to do. So if you came to me as an accelerator partner, um, it would be helpful if you had a fairly unique uh, technology so I could leverage my network. <laughs> the other part is I help companies go into other markets as a group. And so sometimes it's bringing companies to Taiwan, sometimes it's helping Taiwanese entrepreneurs or Saudi entrepreneurs or other entrepreneurs look at the UK or the United States. So that's what I do. And I hope that was you. Come from, comes from the UK, and uh, Rita comes from the Japan. Okay, Rita, it's your turn. Thank you. Hi. Um, uh, just before saying uh, something, uh, you, you, you first, Tom, your first uh, job in Ohio in 2005? Yeah. Uh, I graduated from the Ohio State in 2011, so like, we are in Ohio at that time. We were. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm Ryuta Takeda uh, from Japan. Uh, my, our company is called Levernest. Uh, we are composed of scientists and engineers. Uh, I myself graduated from Ohio State University, have a PhD in biotechnology field. Um, I'm also responsible for American branch of Levernest, uh, but the acceleration program per se, um, we are running, uh, Japan is our original acceleration point and I'm responsible for the international expansion. So uh, I'm gonna talk about the 
Japanese acceleration uh, our program itself that they call Tech Planter. Um, before um, talking about the acceleration program, I should say I should have I should say the uh, our company itself. Uh, as I said, uh, Rivenest is a scientist and engineers company. So like we are the geekiest company in the world. I I can say. Um, so uh, 15 years ago, one five years ago, we were graduate students, and then we launched the company um, without business model. This is we are young. Uh, we launched the company. Uh, we didn't have any network. We didn't have any patent. We didn't have any. Uh, we didn't have money too. So uh, only thing we can do was the education. We learn science. We learn engineering in the graduate school, and we love it. So. If we deliver it to the society, to the school, probably society will like it. And then at that time in 2002, there is a big problem uh, in Japan, uh, kids hating science. So we, tr we are very passionate about solving that problem as a scientist and engineers. Uh, that was the first business. Then um, to be a very cutting edge science uh, education provider, uh, we need to communicate with the uh, cutting edge professors too. So we just kept doing it like 10 years. Then um, this innovation era, um, professors, young professors coming to us, and they, they talk to us, hey, we, I actually wanted to start up, but we don't, we don't know how to do. Um, this is actually probably the Japanese culture. Um, we didn't have, the situation started changing, but we didn't have entrepreneurship program. Um, I also was trained as a researcher, so my boss told me, do not think about the application. Um, it spoils your science. That was the education I got. I, I really got that kind of you know, intensive one, but it, was, uh, it happens in everywhere in Japan. So, um, so it happens. So, how we, so we, we would like to support the scientists and engineers. That was the start. So at that time, 2000, 14, uh, we launched the program, but at that time we didn't know it's called acceleration or not. We didn't even know the name of the uh, program. So what we are doing is very um, simple. Um, we attach the passionate scientists or engineers, uh, launch the company, we help launch the company, and then do whatever means to help them go to the Series A. So that what that's what we do. So from the scratch to Series A. Is it good enough? All right. Thanks. In please. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Bin Lo. I am the uh, CEO in residence for Microsoft Accelerator in Beijing. So talk about Microsoft Accelerator program. Uh, we are focusing for the later stage startup, say later stage from, uh, uh, if, if we talk about the VC's uh, perspective view, that's from uh, Series A to Series B, uh, those stage. So we start this program in uh, year 2012. We have been in the market for five years. Microsoft had uh, uh, seven uh, different accelerators all around the world. In China, China mainland is the only uh, country uh, that we have two accelerators. So one, the uh, accelerator in Beijing had been in market for almost five years. And we have the new one in Shanghai start the operation from this uh, uh, February time. So uh, you can see that China uh, is one of the most important area. Uh, talk about the Beijing Accelerator. Uh, we ran the program uh, twice a year, and every cohort we have like uh, 15 to 20 companies. Uh, as I mentioned, we focus for the later stage. We usually have more than 1,000 formal applications. So uh, our exception rate is lower than 2%. So it's, uh, it's difficult then to uh, enter into the Harvard University. Uh, we provide all kind of uh, mentorship. We provide the space. We provide the uh, free uh, Microsoft uh, Azure uh, cloud uh, credit to those uh, uh, best startups we can uh, recruit. 
uh, in the uh, Great China region, including Taiwan, and we had uh, uh, one of the uh, most uh, successful uh, Taiwanese uh, startup team called uh, Huo Dongxing, uh, or uh, up, uh, up, uh, up uh, uh, in Taiwan. So uh, a very uh, uh, successful one doing the uh, online uh, event management RSVP stuff, very successful. Uh, for the past five years, we had uh, 115 company, uh, sorry, uh, we have uh, 156 company in Microsoft Accelerator Beijing uh, program, and uh, we had uh, 114 graduate, uh, and uh, those 114 companies, uh, three of them got the uh, IPO uh, in the uh, public market, and uh, 13 of them got the uh, merge and acquisition opportunity. So pretty success in terms of the VC. I should say that we use the VC way to recruit the company, we use the standard. However, we are not taking any equity, we are not taking any share, uh, and we are not invested in those startups. What we are looking for is to help those startups to be very successful in the cloud arena, in the uh, big data, AI and AR, uh, those uh, machine learning, etc which we think that we have the domain knowledge, we will understand the future, and we can help them to be success in, in the market. We also will connect with those uh, international accelerators, uh, like our sisters, brothers here around, and the objective for that is, number one, we can recruit even better companies, either in different stage, from your sourcing or from your graduates, or we can leverage your help for our alumni, which graduate from our uh, current program for the first go into market work. We are doing pretty good work at the moment. Uh, as I mentioned, 140 companies graduate from us. 93 of them got the next round of the fund within a year and uh, the overall valuation of those companies uh, entirely uh, is more than uh, six billion US dollar. So that's the uh, high level messaging here. So I'll talk about some other uh, area that uh, we can certainly work together later on. Well, I think after you guys say, I forgot what to say now. <laughs> By the way, okay, I'm Andrew from uh, Malaysia. I run a venture capital firm called Ting Big Venture. I'm also the key responsible person for another equity crowdfunding platform in Malaysia. So basically, in Malaysia, I'm the only person who holds a true license in Malaysia, a VCMC and an equity crowdfunding. Okay, as compared to all my fellow panelists, I think I'm the only VC around. Okay, so I'll just uh, share with you a bit about my firm. Okay, uh, we are a venture capital company that is focusing... Okay, we are not looking for any disruption technology. So if any of you guys are building any disruption technology, don't come to me. I'm the person who I'm just focusing on sustainable business model that's solving a real life problem. Okay, maybe that is where my fund is focusing. We are very focusing on consumer space that we want to solve a real life problem. We want to provide more quality living, more convenience to the market. In terms of my fund structuring, we are a unique breed of entity in Malaysia. Six of my general partners in my company, uh, which I'm the managing partner for now, the only criteria to become our partner is that you need to be there, been there, done that, and exit. So basically, that is the criteria we choose our general partner. So most of us are made out of entrepreneur. So we have, we have built our business, we have failed fast enough, we embrace our failure, and then we get back up. For me personally, I IPO through company. I also been twice a bankruptcy in Malaysia as well. So I've been there, done that, and then my last IPO was in Hong Kong. Okay, and then my fund structuring is a unique way. We made out of 18 high net worth individuals who actually funded into our company, and then 60% of the fund come from uh, sovereign fund income uh, from Malaysia. We're actually managing the fund, managing the pension fund in Malaysia for the government. But uh, most of our GP committed 40% of the fund size. 
Okay, so in terms of how do we differentiate ourselves with other venture capital is that we are entrepreneur made for entrepreneur. Most of us are not from any banking industry, are not from fund manager, we don't work on formula. Basically, we invest with quite a bit of emotion and then we invest in the people that we believe in rather than just any ideas or how bankable it is. So, and then our focus is basically to drive smart capital to our investing company. We are not just giving you money, we are actually, uh, we allow you to uh, leverage on our resources, our network, our domain experience, the network that we have built around across everyone. So basically any of our investing company can access to the resources that we have built along our way. And then we actually provide a lot of uh, investor introduction, market accessibility, we actually mentor them, we work with them to uh, ensuring that they are focusing on what they are supposed to be. And then most, most important is that we want to teach them about failure. I think a lot of startups, when they started it, they want, everyone wanted to go to entrepreneurship. But entrepreneurship is, a, to me, is like a no way return ticket. The moment you jump into entrepreneurship, the only way through is uh, the only way is going through. You just have to keep picking up yourself. Even you fail, you just need to come back up again. I think that is basically uh, mostly about my uh, my venture capital with other people. Yep. Okay, Richard. Uh, very good afternoon. Uh, thank you, firstly, to, uh, to the organizer for having me back here again. It's a very good feeling to be back here and to see that how Innovex have uh, improved uh, over the last two years. Uh, for those who do not know us, uh, firstly, I'm Richard Tan, uh, CEO of uh, InnoSpace Plus. We are located in Shanghai, China. Uh, we only have one location. Uh, so do not be mistaken by the two fakes InnoSpaces in Beijing and the other fake one in Seoul, Korea. So we are the only one uh, in Shanghai. Um, we started about uh, 2011 as an uh, entrepreneur cafe called IPO Club. Uh, and over the years, we sort of like evolved. Uh, we started off uh, as an incubator in 2012, uh, before evolving again to an accelerator with a fund in 2013. Uh, we are focusing, so pretty much, uh, we also adopt and benchmark ourselves uh, against the YC in uh, the US. Uh, we are focusing primarily in the very early stage, uh, even for our funds as well. Uh, most of our uh, acceleration programs as well as uh, incubation services are actually centered on uh, our investment strategies and what have you. Uh, the stage of uh, startups that we focus in, primarily in seed uh, to angel uh, phase and in, in some key uh, domains which actually sort of like goes with each funds. Uh, and because of the focus of, or rather the stages of a startup that we are looking at, uh, we haven't have any, uh, uh, unlike uh, Luo Ping's uh, Microsoft Accelerator, we haven't have any startups that have gone to uh, IPO. But what we have uh, done, uh, or what we have successfully produced uh, in our programs have been what we call Star Ventures, which are defined as uh, startups that have their valuation exceeding uh, US 15 million within 12 months of inceptions. We have eight of them. And uh, each of our programs are so far, uh, each of our acceleration programs have produced one such uh, star ventures to date. Uh, last year when we came, uh, I reported six, this year eight. Um, the, uh, yeah, and, uh, and most of our startups so far have, uh, if you look at the China, every year we have a China top 100 uh, startup ranking. Uh, we tend to produce six to seven of them, uh, kind of a thing. And because of that, we have been uh, ranked uh, for two consecutive years as uh, the best accelerator in Shanghai by the uh, Shanghai Tech Bureau and uh, top 10 in whole of China. Um, and also because of that, the, our funds also continue to do fairly well. Our first funds about uh, six million US. Uh, well, we have totally invested out uh, into 50 plus um, portfolio companies and to date uh, we are starting to do some ex uh, exceeding uh, this year and to date our book gain RRR stands at a fairly impressive um, rate of uh, 73% and this is after a great, uh, in a way we sort of like watered down or take away some of the uh, 
uh, the overvaluation kind of a thing that have been happening in China over the last few years. So after that, uh, even we look at it realistically, our funds currently have a book gain RRR of 33 percent. So we are confident of uh, uh, maintaining it. We are rolling our second funds of about 30 million US uh, this year. Hopefully, we are about 60 percent uh, subscribed now, uh, and hope to roll this out in the uh, by August this year. Um, we also invested in some uh, overseas startups, but again, these are the startups that uh, uh, we invest in the overseas startups, but in the Chinese entity, uh, in the China entity. Uh, so the reason why I'm here, I I was impressed by the uh, quality of the startups I saw last year. So hopefully, uh, that sort of like uh, opened my mind about the quality of startups in in Taiwan and also in the other countries, and hopefully that. Uh, there might be some gems that I might be able to take home with me. Thank you. Hello. Hello, I'm Kevin from Taiwan Accelerator. Um, before introducing myself and TA, uh, I would like to know more about our audience. Anyone of you guys has started a business or is starting a business? Can you raise your hand? Not bad, very good. Otherwise, it, it doesn't make sense for us to talk here. <laughs> me, me too. Okay, um, TA um, actually uh, is the first seed accelerator in Taiwan. Um, sometimes, actually most of the time, being the first is, is not easy. All my friends and my people in the market told me that uh, you guys are crazy doing things like that uh, because uh, we are of the highest risk in terms of investing because we, we in, invested in, in the most early stage startup giving them like uh, 30, uh, 30,000 US dollar in return for 10% equity stake like what our US counterparts are all doing like 10 years ago. Um, so it's, it's very interesting to see that um, uh, we are the so-called first one to do, to do the same thing in Taiwan. And our first program launched last year, October. Uh, we already finished our first cohort. And the second cohort is going to start in August this year. So the, we, we, we are adjusting the program month by month to make it better, to improve all our resources, improve our, all the elements of our program um, in order to more effectively and efficient, efficiently help our startup. And also, we are the first seed accelerator in Taiwan to organize Demo Day in Taipei, Silicon Valley, and also New York. Um, the objective is, is very simple, just one goal, is to help the startup in Taiwan to broaden their wheels and also to start connecting with the global capital markets. And uh, also we, we have three months program like most, most of the other accelerator does. And uh, one thing uh, we try to make it more precise and special is that uh, we have a so-called dual mentor program. So for every startup enter into our program, we provide one business mentor and also a finance mentor to them. A lot of people told me that, hey man, financials for the early stage startup is not important. No people will care about that, we'll give them a shit. Okay, that's fine. But uh, our hope is that we want the startup to try to know how to build a financial model at the very beginning, to know how to control the cost, to know how to operate the company based on the financials. Otherwise, they will die very soon, I believe. So I think uh, we, we make a good decision because uh, actually this month we are very busy in bringing the startup to meet all the investors after the demo days. And guess what? Most of the VCs, 
they asked the startup to provide the pro forma financial statement. So I think, um, actually it's not just for, for, the, for the Taiwanese VCs. Um, when we are in New York, some investor in, in the United States, they also request the financial forecast, a reasonable financial forecast. So we provide that and we help the startup to know how to create their income statement, balance sheet, and also uh, cash flow statement, okay, during our three months program. That's what we are doing. And uh, I know all of, most of you guys are from Taiwan, so I, I would like to use one minute to do it in Mandarin. Otherwise, I, I, uh, I want you guys to know more about um, the program. Um, 这个是讲给很多我们台湾的创业家听的 TA台湾创数 是台湾第一家总指加速器他们会给我们 所以商业的导师给他之外，也会给他们提供一个财务的导师，让他们可以啊更快可以啊能够建立自己的整个财务模型，然后跟投资人沟通的时候呢，可以用啊投资人听得懂，投资人会觉得他们成熟的语言来
going on executing your, your idea. So uh, typically, you will uh, create your MVPs, you will iterate, prototype, see if the market is the same also in Europe. Often, this, there are some differences, so you will adapt things, you will uh, change some path. Uh, and after these uh, 10 months, you will be ready to uh, either to incorporate if you, uh, you came without uh, a, a real uh, startup, or you will uh, be ready to, uh, to raise money if you are already a, a startup. So today's School Lab uh, is working this way uh, between Paris and uh, so the Silicon Valley, uh, Bogota in Colombia, uh, Cape Town in South Africa, uh, Tel Aviv in Israel, and Singapore uh, in Asia. Uh, our first uh, foot in Asia was, uh, was Singapore. And uh, this way, basically, we work as a urban spoke. We are in a specific places like that, and from there, we are able to, uh, to, uh, to create such programs um, uh, in other countries in the, in the region. So that's why, uh, for us, this is the first time in, uh, in Taiwan and in Taipei. And typically, uh, a good opportunity to expand uh, uh, our presence in, in Asia and find uh, many, many great things. Because uh, learning from you, learning from uh, people at Innovex, uh, we see a lot of uh, complementarities between what we do in Europe, in the US, and, uh, and in Asia. Thank you all. Now we have uh, six accelerators from the France, UK, Japan, China, and of course Taiwan, and the one we see from the Malaysia. So for all staffs, if you want their help, and right now you know how they operate and how they can help you. So if you are interested in to connect them, please don't forget to change the, your name card after our panelist. And because of the time limitations, I saw for the following questions, I don't ask everybody to answer the to answer the question or share their experience. But I just choose three or four for each question. And others, if I don't choose you, but you want to share your experience, please just pick up your microphone and say something. Okay. So for, for the following question, I would like to invite Andrew, Kevin, and Christoph to share your experience on the how did you select and your criteria of investment for the startups? Okay, okay maybe this, I'll, I'll take this question first then. Okay, I think uh, in terms of what is our investment criteria, uh, we actually have a four pillar. The fir first pillar about our investment, the first thing is uh, we need to look into the founder domain experience. Okay, and then we want to look into their team execution ability. So they say, if you want to compete in this space, you have to tell us, eh, okay, what makes you think that you can execute this 10 times better than others? What kind of experience do you bring with you? What makes you think that you can actually do that and achieve that kind of KPI that you promised? Okay, second thing we want to look into, it, what solution are you proposing? What are the available solutions in the market? What is the unique selling point of your solution? And, and then I think the third part will be, what problem are you solving? We have seen a lot of ideas being pitched to us, but most of the time, some of the time that we look at it, it's like, okay, it's a good solution, but I can do without it. So sometimes it's like, yeah, not bad, uh, but we see that you might have to educate the market. You are not solving a problem in the market, and then you need to solve a pain point. If you are not solving a problem, your consumer or your target user will not be willing to pay for you. And then we also want to look at who is going to be your user. Okay? When, when you talk about you have this solution, you're solving this problem, we want to know that you clearly identify who are your target audience, what are your market segmentation, how are you going to onboard them, what is your customer aggregation strategy, what is your go-to-market strategy. And then we want to look into further than that, how are you going to retain them? You see, nowadays it's not just about customer aggregation, it's about retention of your customers. I think that is actually a very important metrics to be measured. And then after they pass through the four thing that we like it, we will then drill on a bit further. We want to speak more with the founder to understand the founder. The founder needs to be the best seller in the company. 
Because to me, if the founder do not know how to sell, I think that is going to be a challenge. The art of selling to me is the transfer of emotion of certainty. You need to learn to sell your vision. You need to learn to sell your ideas to your customers, your vision to your team, to your group members, to your colleague who is going to buy into your vision. You need to learn how to sell to your vendor, your partners, why partnering with you. I think selling is a very important skill set. Okay, and then we want to look into also the leadership of the founders. If you are not able to attract talent to work for you, we do not want to invest in companies where it's a one-man show or maybe it's just a particular leader. So what if the particular founder falls sick or leaves the company? We want to have a look at the founder that they have the ability to attract talent to work for them. And then I think just to top up a bit, maybe it's particularly on me. I'm not trying to implicate to other VCs. I even look into the charisma of the founders and then the founder needs to be at least at a very good fitness level. I'm not saying about you need to be very muscular. You know, because the reason why, because I always believe eh, fitness is something that you cannot inherit, you cannot borrow. It clearly displays uh, hard working, a commitment to yourself and taking care of yourself by looking good. I used to have a company by three professors in Malaysia that's raising five million USD from me. We wanted to invest in the company. And then the last criteria that did not manage to pull off is that the co-founder the, the co of the CEO of the company is a doctorate about 45 years old. The healthness, uh, the fitness is a bit of our concern. I think a bit obese, uh, looks quite tired a bit. And then that is actually the main reason why we pull off. Because we think that even you can't take care of yourself. How would I be able to answer to my funder to put that five million in you and then have to expecting you to take good care of my money where you can't even take good care of yourself? Okay. And then also another thing that uh, just to talk about on what are my investment. We love to work with company with at least a product market fit. Okay. And then uh, we want them to have a certain traction minimum to have at least 100 paying customers. Your retention rate of customers need to be at least at 40%. We love to work with companies who are on an uh, expansion stage. That means that you have done it well, you have created an impact in your own country before you're actually talking about you want to scale to other cities. I think to have a strong base in your own country, in your own space, that is very critical. Then we will talk about how to expand. And then when we talk, when our fund come in, it comes with a lot of intelligent money. Because we're going to pull in our resources, we're going to pull in the certain expertise, industry expertise to help you to scale. We will work with you on your second round of funding. We will underwrite the whole journey with you together. And then I think the next best part is that we actually let you, you know, we bring you around to our network, investor introduction, and work with people that has work, been working with me. And then our fund actually have se several matching funds with the governments. So anything that we invest, government want to come in. Because uh, I think they, they kind of love our due diligence assessment form. That is why uh, when we invest, government will want to match our investment. Yep, I think so basically that is about it. Thank you, Kevin. Oh, we have some so-called basic criteria about how to select a startup. Actually, um, the criteria is on our website, TA website. It says that <laughs> you should have an innovative idea and product that is not yet widely used, okay? And the second one is, you have the opportunity to drive rapid growth in a niche market, all right? You should have a repeatable and scalable business model. And uh, one thing uh, is quite important for us is that, is that uh, you still hasn't received angel round financing. Because if your valuation is too high, we cannot invest because we have a fixed valuation uh, as I've just mentioned, uh, 30,000 US dollar for 10% equity stake. 
But uh, actually, all this criteria is bullshit if we don't have a good founder. So I totally agree with what Angel, Andrew said is about the people. So uh, we will look at the guy or the lady, uh, whether you are aggressive, you are confident, you are smart, are you smart enough? Actually, not just smart, but fucking smart. You have to be very smart and to convince us that you can execute your business plan. You can lead a team. So um, I tell you a, a small secret is, is that uh, in our so-called uh, uh, score sheet, uh, when we interview the startup, the people factor is way 60%, 66-0%. It's all about the founder. If a founder is cool, he can do any kind of business, we believe. So if we have Mark Zuckerberg to do something like a, a, a toilet paper rental sharing, okay, maybe he, he will make it become a unicorn. So that is what we, we believe. So the criteria actually is very simple. The, the team, the team, and also the team. I will go on with people, people, people. <laughs> But uh, typically, uh, and we have uh, uh, at School Lab, we have a student at very, very early stage, uh, even just the, the idea. So it's even more important because, as you say, uh, we have smart people, but we have to, uh, to take into account uh, the culture and the specific specificities of countries like we have in Europe and you have in Asia. Because on that matter, we are different from the US. I, I mean by that, that um, when we have all uh, the, the young people in front of us, they are smart. But they are not all open-minded and ready to fail. Because in, uh, in France and uh, in Asia, uh, to, uh, to go through the education and be the best, you don't fail. So you, uh, you are a bit afraid of that. And uh, they have to be ready to uh, unlearn and then relearn uh, a new way of uh, doing innovation. And typically, this is what is important. This is the, also the passion and the energy. Because um, um, our education system, and when I say our, I, I say Europe and Asia, is excellent, but tiring. Typically, if I remember what I was doing uh, when I was 18 to uh, prepare uh, my entering in engineering schools, I had like 37 hours of classes of math and physics, plus uh, 40 hours of homeworks. So when you are 18, you go through a system where uh, you're completely exhausted as uh, if you were at Goldman Sachs or McKinsey. And it's a, it has a good importance because when you have a, a startup in front of you, they need the energy to sell, they need the energy to pitch, they need the energy to, uh, to be there uh, for... Uh, 24-7, and uh, you can feel today that when uh, young people come, the entrepreneurship is trendy. So they all want to try that. But beyond that, they, need, uh, they, they don't they just need the skills, they need the guts, they need the energy, they need the passion. And the second part of the people for us, this was a static part. It's more the dynamic part and the interpersonal dynamic. And this is what we try to do uh, with all uh, the way we bring our content in our program, is to mix them, mix them together between young, young people, but also with uh, C executives, uh, people with a lot of experience, to understand how they work together. Because in the end, for us, the idea is uh, in a too early stage to bet on the idea. We bet on people. Uh, if you think that they will pivot a lot, the idea won't be there in six months or uh, in two years. But the team, it has to survive through the, the many pitfalls that uh, they, they will uh, encounter. So uh, this is why we, do. we, uh, we select people and then during our programs, during uh, f uh, four to 10 months, depending on the program, they will work together as teams on a specific project, specific startup, but also between each other in our old network 
to understand how they uh, can work together and in the end, maybe to form a new team, a new group, and a, and a, a real firm that has a, that we are that a deep and strong links. So definitely people. Yes, team is the most important thing for uh, staffs. Okay, anyone to want to add more? Uh, okay, yeah, I, I just want to add one more thing that uh, you guys highlighting the uh, importance of the, the team, in, importance of the people, uh, but I want to add one more thing, say that uh, when, when we see a team is important, to me it's more important that the team can really communicate with the peoples, with the customers, with the investors. Otherwise, you got the money, you got the good idea, but they are not listening to you, <laughs> right? So, so, so the function for the VC, the function for the accelerator is to help those guys. So communication, in my mind, is probably more important than the business model, than the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, some really other cool stuff, because uh, we can find the regular company, but if they stick on something, they, 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 they can really uh, well understand or to get the, uh, the advice from the right people, they can still be successful, right? Yeah. But that's uh, what I want to share. Yeah, let yeah. me add on uh, to, to, to that point. I think as a startup, especially in the earlier stage, the, those uh, before the uh, stage A those startups, uh, as an investor, I think we are quite realistic that uh, the teams would not be, or rather the project, the teams would not be complete. Uh, there will be some gaps uh, in terms of the product, the solutions, and even the team structure. Uh, the role of the accelerator is really to help provide uh, that missing link or the bridge. Uh, per se, but the team, especially the CEO, needs to be humble, uh, and this is uh, echoing what uh, Luo Ping had mentioned, um, and and this is a typical challenge that I find facing the uh, young entrepreneur, especially in China, uh, because of Xiao Wang Di, Xiao Gong Zhu kind of a mentality. A lot of them grew up to think that they are the best and are not quite willing to to uh, listen, and I think that this is unfortunately I've seen quite a few startups failing. Uh, so, therefore, being humble is definitely one. Um, then, from the as an investor point of view, the other point which I would like to point out is uh, before, I mean, like, if you consider all those uh, uh, comments that have been provided by the other uh, co panelists, uh, the other point is really that um, before an investor or as a VCs or angel investors put in the money, uh, especially in the earlier stage uh, startups, we always consider we are considering how to exit before investing. So therefore, um, for as a uh, CEO or as a startup, who do you bring in as your uh, investor are very important. So it's not just about just uh, um, bringing in money or accepting money from, from whoever that's out there in the market. But how are you going to find the investors that are able to provide beyond um, the financial resources. It's the strategic resources that comes with it. So as an investor, then we see, hey, you know, like this is, uh, first of all, it demonstrates the intelligence of the uh, founders to, to accept smart money. Then, uh, and that gives confidence to the other investors, the follower, uh, following investors. Because we know that putting in money uh, there, we are able to then work with uh, similar or, or like-minded investors to provide, to bring in the resources, consolidate all these resources to help these startups to grow and bring them to the next level. I think that um, uh, some little food for thought for some of the other startups here uh, to, to, to think about who you accept as your investors. Thank you. How about both of you? Want something? Okay. Okay, let's move to the next question. I would like to invite uh, the Ryuta, Bin, Richard, and Christoph to answer. Because when, when you're talking about uh, we want to help the startup go to the global market, but you cannot do it alone. So you need some international partner 
to help you to do something. So I would like to ask you, how do you build the tight network and the relationship with your international partners to give business value for startups? Okay, understand? Uh, Ruyuta first. Ruyuta. Um, so, um, to connect to the, is it inbound or outbound, we, either way, this is, to, um, so, me personally, myself, uh, how to uh, maintain and uh, connect to the other accelerator or other partners internationally is, um, to me, the culture of give and give, to me, it's not, give and take is very old fashioned, 1980s model, I could say. Um, nowadays, uh, I personally say give and give. So before doing business, um, you may first of all do something to do um, to solve one other's problem, your friend's problem. Then um, you may probably get asked, could you do this? Could you uh, uh, ask a favor? And then uh, you say probably instantly yes then um, just give your hand to solve others' problem. And then it piled up, and then it's gonna be a real tight connection. That's what I really exper experience in these days. Um, as I said, I'm responsible for the international expansion of our program. Uh, we started our program in Japan 2014, and now, we have a showcase even in Singapore, Malaysia, uh, Thailand, like three days later, and also uh, Philippines and US, UK, and of course in Taiwan too. So how, how can we do that is um, we just kept um, talking with, communicating with the partners, uh, kept communicating is not just chatting, just kept asking a favor, um, also, um, get your help the uh, your counter partners like uh, uh, in the periodically. That's a uh, give and give uh, type of maintenance of uh, communication or uh, connection. That's probably what I learned in these two or three years. Okay, so uh, my point of view uh, for the go to market or for the uh, go to international market. Certainly, it's important for the startups. Uh, however, we need to have some uh, paradise shift in our mind. So, two major one. Number one is the startup or those uh, early stage company, can they only do the business with the uh, startup? Not at all. Ideally, they should work with the big name company they should work with the big name company. That makes them even more successful. And to, con uh, to connect them with this uh, big name company, so uh, you can use different way. So one is you leverage your current connection from your accelerator itself to talk with the Fortune 500 company to let them uh, fully convince, say that this is the company I want to help and I have some project in uh, not only China, but also Taiwan, but also Japan, I can be helpful. So that's one approach. The other one is to leverage your partner. So probably Asia, so we are talking about the Asia Pacific uh, Accelerator Network. So Asia is the region that we need more connection. We need more relationship. We need more this kind of introduction. We are not like U.S. because uh, some of my Israel uh, alumni or some of my Israel uh, friends, when they got the first round of the fund, what they are to do is they move this whole family to Silicon Valley and they, they form uh, the companies there and do the U.S. market we see in a quarter or we see even like uh, two months time. To me, it's not easy for a Chinese company or for a Taiwanese company or for a Japanese company 
go into Singapore or Malaysia uh, market, and they can make the things happen in like a, like a two months or a quarter times. Why? Because they need the local partner help them. Then you have the choice of two kind of local partner. First is our accelerator around, uh, our sister's brother accelerator here around. That's why the importance of uh, Asia Pack accelerator network. That's important. We got the trust already. We got the common understanding from this kind of uh, panel discussion. And you trust that my taste, you trust the company that I select, you can help them to go into those markets. And that's save quite a lot of work, save quite a lot of the time. And we can get a easy win-win situation. And also remember, the famous closing the case and say that uh, for the startup, when they want to be successful in one arena, they need to build end-to-end -end solution rather than one solution which is good enough. So do they need to build all those ecosystems by themselves? Not at all. If they can be excellent in one area, they can still leverage their help from all those uh, friends here around. So I'm talking about the two things. So one is if you are lucky enough, you can, you, you, you can convince the big name company in your country and leverage this network for going to the market, go ahead to do it. Otherwise, leverage those accelerators here around, those VC friends around, they can significantly reduce your work. And that's why we are sitting here. That's why we provide our, our value to our alumni, to our startups, to our, uh, uh, our uh, local partners there. So that's what I want to show. But one call to action I want to add here is uh, uh, we are recruiting our cohort nine uh, startup. As I mentioned that uh, I'm looking for the later stage uh, series A to B. So if, we, if you guys have this kind of a good startup, recommend it to me and I give them uh, a, a, the express track. Yeah. Uh, maybe I... Um, we are a private sector um, player, uh, market oriented. Um, definitely, I mean, when we invest in uh, startups, we want them to grow. So if they are able to grow on a global arena, uh, we are more than happy to, to, to uh, encourage them to expand overseas. Uh, but let's face it, I think that they, for startups, un unlike the multinationals, um, resources are very limited. So how then, so from, uh, even from our perspective, we have to like, uh, who, who do we chose to work with uh, on the international front to help the startup to grow, we are particularly uh, cautious. So we, uh, like we will work with um, some partners overseas in a particular domain. Um, for example, I mean, like the last deal I met uh, DMM dot make uh, Akiba uh, in, in this particular platform. I think that the uh, for hardware type of projects, they provide a very interesting uh, platform in in Tokyo. So. We work with them uh, in helping us some of our startups to have a uh, landing in, in, in Tokyo. Uh, likewise, I mean, like we work with uh, TUM in Munich, Germany. Uh, that's more particularly to, to, to look at helping our um, industrial 4.0 type of industry, 4.0 type projects uh, to work with companies in, in, in Germany. So and as a result of that, we start work, uh, our startups are working with Siemens, and also now working with uh, BMW and uh, Audi for connected cars, etc. But I think the, um, the other point uh, which I agreed with uh, uh, Mr. Lopping is that um, working with multinationals, especially for a startup, that is really very uh, crucial. And especially, I mean, like, um, uh, and this is from our own experience, we work with uh, uh, Siemens and BMW and Audi for a particular type of uh, sectors, domains. Well, once these um, companies or the startup have been selected by this company, in a way, that is validating, first of all, that their solutions are cutting edge. Uh, and that gives us the confidence that, hey, you know, that is indeed a company or a startup that is worth investing in. And obviously, because of that, the, the exit 
kind of a possibility is much greater. So I think that the uh, 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 try to go with the uh, accelerator or some partners that are able to link you up with all these big companies and all this. I think that will save a lot of uh, uh, learning curves there. I think that is something that you should really consider. Yeah. Uh, I think I just want to talk about a bit from investor anger. Sorry, Tom. Okay. I think uh, if talking about expansion, okay, please do not look at VC are competing against each other. VC actually is complementing each other. Some of our deal, we prefer to have several VC to co-invest with one lead investor VC in the particular home country to drive it. And then if you understand the VC world equity financing investment, every VC have their different appetite at, at different stages. People like us, maybe we focus on seed to series A, but what we do is that any investing company that we invested, that they're actually looking to scale across series A and B, what do we do is that basically we will help them to pitch to other VC who are bigger than me, who are focusing on Series B and above. We actually help to funnel all the deal flow to those Series B and C, uh, VC, and then help my investing company to actually scale across it. We recently done a deal. We personally orchestra one deal. We are into an e-commerce space of fashion. We orchestra a deal to deal with Sequoia and Lazada to actually invest, to actually buy out our investment company. But then, just that that instrument don't allow us to exit within the next two years. But I think this is a very good because the moment we tap on Lazada, we actually assess to a whole database of Lazada. And then we ha also have some company that in Singapore, we actually scale it quite well. We, at the end of the day, we actually uh, funnel our deals to another VC in uh, China that actually help us to have a deal with Spotify. So this is actually invest... Uh, how a VC angle, how we actually help our investing company to expand. Uh, and then not to mention all the connection that we make along the way, that this is maybe on personal touch, but on investor angle, we actually work with other bigger VC to scale our business model. I, I, sorry, I missed out the point. Um, yeah, so I'd like to uh, add on to that. Um, uh, as I said earlier, I mean like, um, no one man is a, an island. So what we do in, in China is that we have formed an, a VC alliance. Uh, people, uh, it's the collections of uh, VCs that are looking at similar or just about the next level kind of uh, uh, stage of startups. We work with them, so we do a lot of deal uh, referral and stuff like that. So that sort of like helps quite a lot. But I, I think that the, the, the reason why I jump in is really that before I forget, um, uh, echoing what um, uh, Luo Ping had uh, suggestions. In fact, this is something which uh, had been on my mind. Uh, for a while. I mean, like, uh, annually right now, we receive about uh, uh, 8,000 business plans. Our acceleration programs, we receive about 800 uh, each time. So, and we only select about 10. So, this is very trying for, for a private sector uh, uh, accelerator, which have, we have got limited manpower resources to go through all this business. So, if we can have a, uh, and this is something which I would like to, and in fact, bouncing off with the uh, uh, Michael Lin uh, here, is whether we could do a green lane kind of a thing whereby for startups that have gone through the programs in, in our preferred accelerator uh, partners in Taiwan uh, with the big corporations and what have you, they can you know, get, get into the green lane and that sort of like save us as a poor private sector players. <laughs> that kind of, the the uh, a very tiring uh, process of going through all this BP. I think that this is something which uh, I, I think I would like to expand a little bit more onto that. So... I'm, for, for entrepreneurs, and many of you are entrepreneurs, and when you're working with local programs, you're working with an, with an incubator accelerator, they have, a, they have a program, a curriculum, if you want to call it that, uh, and they don't differ that much between one to another, though some are better at execution than others. Um, but where they really make the difference is the leadership of the accelerator's network. And yeah, after looking at these programs for for as long as I have, that seems to be the differentiation. The, the strength of the network of the leadership team, the, the general partners in the local network is a really leverageable thing for a startup. And if you've got a good network available to you, that improves your success. The other difference maker, by the way, is the quality of the teams coming in. Uh, it's kind of like a sports, uh, kind of like a football academy, if any of you are football fans. Liverpool has academy, Burnley has academy. They both produce great football players, but Liverpool will produce more great football players. It's because the coaching at Liverpool's better, maybe, 
but it's more about the fact that Liverpool gets better kids into their academy at the beginning. And that's how accelerators and incubators work, very much so. Once you leave that local environment, that leverageable network starts to decrease. Um, and the founders then kind of look out there and they start building international networks. And some of the international networks are really quite good. And they're based on very personal <laughs> relationships. And the ability for the accelerator, then ultimately you as, as, as founding teams, your ability to build capital into the partners that you want in your international market. But what I found in looking at how these programs are organizing is that there's those networks and then there's the market for your product or service. And if they don't align, you, it creates challenges for the entrepreneurs. And so from the accelerator side, it's the ability to be um, adaptive to the needs of the entrepreneurs so that if they have a product where Silicon Valley is the right destination and the accelerator team has a good network there, that's where they go. But one of the, the lessons I got was from New Zealand. So New, New Zealand is a lot like Taiwan, a lot like Japan. If you're going to scale, you're going to scale abroad. You know, in New Zealand, you're definitely going to scale abroad. And they set up this thing in Silicon Valley called Kiwi Landing Pad. And I was talking to a number of the New Zealand programs about where their companies went when they went to the United States. And a lot of them did not go to Kiwi Landing Pad. One was a defense uh, technology, a water defense technology. And whereas there's a sizable West Coast defense community, San Diego has a really big defense uh, community. You really kind of want to be on the east coast of the United States where there are all these ports and particularly in water technology where you have Newport News and you have Charleston and you have all these naval ports on the east coast of the United States. And those are when the accelerator and the entrepreneur need to build and they need to build their network. And so that's what I try to help when the need of the entrepreneur is different than the network of the accelerator. The other point is that the entrepreneur needs to understand why they're going international. What are they looking for? Are they looking for a market, usually? Are they looking for money? Or are they looking for talent? And sometimes they're looking for talent as much as they're looking for market. The last part for the entrepreneurs in the room is that successful entrepreneurs, not always, but often need to have a level of self-awareness. Because when you're going international, you're almost by definition going out to scale. And companies scale for a number of different reasons. They scale because of the market they have available to them and the relevance of the product or service to that market. But often what their scale cap is, is the talent and the self-awareness of the, the, the founder. The founder may represent a great product or service that has a great market, but they don't have the self-awareness to recognize that they're not the person that's gonna take it there, that they need to take a different role in their company. And that's kind of a hard thing to do for entrepreneurs. That's one of the reasons why I think accelerators do reasonably well on scale, because if you've invested money into a company, then you have, you have leverage, and you, you have capital with the company to say, look, dude, this company can grow but it's going to grow with you as the CTO and not as the CEO. And we're going to find somebody else to lead it, but you'll still you know, become super successful if we're successful. And that's where I think, as entrepreneurs, you think about when you go international. When you think about your partner, it's not just, you know, because everybody wants you. Every country in the world wants entrepreneurs to come to that country. There are a gazillion silicons out there. Everybody has a silicon, right? There's Silicon Swamp and Silicon Wadi and Silicon Lagoon, which is Nigeria, by the way. So everybody wants you. It's your understanding of what you need out of that market and why you're going out there and what is the things that you're trying to get is, is really what I think is going to make the difference for you. Stuff. We, uh, I think we completely agree with uh, what you just said, and, uh, and this is the way we, uh, we try to be global at School Lab, because as a company, 
we are also a startup in terms of global expansion. And, uh, and we want to give to the startups that we have uh, at School Lab, but also the, uh, our uh, companies, the opportunity to go where they need to go. And typically, uh, this is what you, what you said, like uh, when we had the uh, Silicon Valley uh, program, everybody wants to go to uh, Silicon Valley. And when we tell them is that, okay, go to the Silicon Valley, but don't be silly <laughs> in the Silicon. <laughs> because typically, uh, there are things there that maybe are not for your firm. You, uh, if, you need, if you need talents, you can have talents somewhere. We, better talents or the same level, but a lot cheaper than in the Silicon Valley. Or in terms of market, maybe this is not the place. So we want to be able to orient our uh, startups to the right place. And for that, we need to expand also ourselves. And to do it, we do it with companies, big companies. They are the, the, our lead to enter a market because they need often to go there, so they are a resource. They are a resource in terms of, it's a financial resource for us that we will use for, for startups then, and they open doors. They, we, they already have a, a network on the, uh, of their own, and when they want to enter another place, by their name, by their brand, it opens door uh, more easily. So this is also the, the way we go, like uh, we decided to go to Colombia, South Africa, Singapore, because we had this opportunity to go there. Either because firms from Europe wanted to go there to decipher a new, a new market, because when you are a multinational, even if you, are, you sell products in Asia, you don't know Asia. You don't know people, you don't know users, you don't know user experiences. And, and this is what they want to do via uh, innovation, entrepreneurship, knowing the, uh, the user. But also, we have uh, firms in countries where we are not, who uh, heard about um, innovation uh, via all these new methodologies, and they want to uh, welcome us. So it's an opportunity via big firms. Then we do partnerships with universities mainly, to get talents and young people, and young people from where we go. Because we don't want to bring also uh, people there just to come see and, uh, and leave. It's important to uh, understand where we go via the people who, uh, who are making uh, the, the country. And in the end, uh, I will admit that we are not uh, <laughs> known all over the world, so just the name School Lab, don't, uh, we don't have calls every day saying, okay, come to us, come to us. So we do, uh, we do as partners at School Lab, uh, like every entrepreneur uh, does uh, here. Uh, we use our own uh, personal, uh, personal uh, network to open doors. And, uh, and this is what works. Like, uh, uh, if you take myself, I've, I, have three, uh, <laughs> I have three masters, one PhD from schools like Stanford and other things. I have a network of thousands of people and the other founders of School Lab, the same. And uh, all these people, when we bring solutions around startups and accelerators, they are ready to, uh, to listen to you a lot more than just you if you come to sell something. Because uh, it's, an it's a win-win. It's, it's an opportunity for them to, uh, to know new talents, to know uh, new, uh, new countries. So these synergies that you have all over the world, so the world seems huge, but in the end, it's quite a small village. And, uh, but you, you have to expand the startup way. Okay, we only have 20 minutes left. So I would like to skip one question and uh, jump into the last question. And uh, that question is just about us the accelerator of VCs, not the, the staffs. So today we are in the AAN Forum, the Asia Pacific Accelerator Network. I believe Accelerator Network, if we can really build up the good network, then we can benefit for the staffs. So I would like to invite all of you, all of you, to give some suggestion to Professor Huang. How could he 
run the AAN better by building the AAN Asia Pacific Accelerator Network. Wow, it's a big question. <laughs> Anyone want to do the first? Okay, okay, thank so you. So I worked for worked with a big network for a long time, and I also worked with, a, it's not really a competing network, but a similar network called the Global Accelerator Network, which was originally a Techstars network based in Denver. The challenge with networks is that you're trying to engage, particularly accelerator networks, you're trying to engage really busy people to, to, to become busier. And the way that you get that done is to make sure that the AAN is relevant to the day-to-day -day challenges that they're facing. And that's not easy. You know, it, it's, it's much the same like any new company, any startup, or any existing company. You're creating a value proposition for people to join. And 20, 30 years ago, these networks, you know, almost, almost were organically grown. You know, I'm a, I'm a pipe fitter and I'm joining the pipe fitters community, or I'm a business incubator and I'm going to join the business incubator community. But that's not the way it is anymore, in part because information has become democratized and you can get a lot of what you need to run your program without joining a network. You can't get everything, but there's a lot available. So from my perspective, and this isn't any comment on AAN specifically, but if I were building the network, I would spend an awful lot of time with the people that you want in the network and identify where's the commonality that we as the network provider can provide real value to make it easier for them to do their jobs, to help them grow better companies, and to help that facilitate that network's trading of ideas, of companies, and things like that. And that, that takes a real commitment. And uh, I, you know, I really salute the, the efforts of AAN because it's not easy. And I can tell you that from my own experience because I worked on one of those for 10 years. And you constantly, and I mean constantly, year after year, have to prove your value to the network. Uh, and if you do that, you'll build a great network for this community, and you'll build a great network for the entrepreneurs. And I mean, and they're the ones that make the magic happen ultimately. And if you did that, that would be awesome. Right, tough questions. Um, so I don't have an answer to this, but um, probably nowadays the go beyond the border line is getting easier. Not easy, of course, still super difficult. But still, um, go beyond the culture is very, very difficult. So in this network, probably this year already been a lot of uh, uh, international startups coming to Taiwan and then Taiwanese startups going to the uh, abroad. But um, this, the number of uh, the startups go beyond the border is getting increased. But how can we understand the cultural difference of other countries? For example, Japan. Uh, Japan is very interesting but tricky company, uh, a tricky country. Um, especially Tokyo, uh, people are cool, um, super cool. We are shy. So um, very difficult to uh, get in touch with the CXO level guy. So, uh, but you need to understand the culture. So, okay, Tokyo is not super speedy uh, town to doing the business, but once you bridge to the CXO level, there is a trust uh, you can uh, actually build. So this kind of, but if you didn't know the culture of Tokyo or culture of Japan, um, it's going into that Tokyo and then have a business trip uh, when we try to deal all, all of the things, but it never happens, then you disappoint. So, but it's very, um, uh, not, not that good way. So it's how, this, my, my claim is how to, if we have the cultural session or uh, cultural understanding, we can uh, actually uh, raise with the network, that would be the good, great help for the, maybe five years later or 10 years later. Yeah, that's my suggestion. So uh, I would like to take the chance to appreciate the uh, invitation from uh, uh, Dr. Huang, and this is actually the uh, 
uh, the amazing work uh, as uh, uh, the uh, other panelist uh, you also mentioned this is this is not easy certainly not easy at all uh, on the other side uh, if we look at the the, uh, the history so we also always say that first tier company that they are developing the standardization they are developing the procedures uh, they are developing uh, some some really know-how stuff. In the second tier company, they are developing the product. And third tier, which is compete on the price. So I think, Dr. Huang, you already take the leadership role to positioning you, to positioning AAN as the uh, top tier entity or organization that you try to define some common standard stuffs and we can copy, we can duplicate, and we can certainly help each other on that. So, uh, so I think the, uh, the positioning is quite important. So uh, what I'm looking for, I don't know, but uh, I want to see if, if we come back next year, more people will recognize the value for that, or uh, we can probably uh, register a, a, a real entity, say that uh, uh, AAN Association, something I don't know, but uh, uh, certainly my, my, my belief, the leadership, that's the leadership. That's the way that we can all get the benefit and we can all do a relative easier work together and help each other here. Okay. I think uh, Professor Huang has done a very good job. I have partnered with several entities in Taiwan. I think over the one year, uh, Professor Huang is the most aggressive, really working very hard. One of the most working hard person that I ever met in my life, especially in Taiwan. Eh? Okay, uh, I would not dare to say I will give you any advice, but I would just want to share some of my opinion. I think uh, in terms of this AAN, things has done very well. Uh, however, there are certain equations wasn't solved yet. Okay, in terms of maybe you could actually run certain immersion program. Okay, uh, my company, my VC firm actually did a several immersion program to Japan, to China. We actually been the investing company of us, travel to Japan, travel to China just for a week, and then we do some introduction, visiting some incubator, visiting some escalator, and then investor connect. We run some event in a particular country, and then I think it actually bring a lot of benefit to my company. I think uh, you have actually sent few team to Malaysia as well. I'd love to host them again. Please send them here more. And then I'm not sure about Taiwan government or central bank in Taiwan. However, in Malaysia, Singapore and Thailand, our central bank and our security commission are working very closely. We are the first Asian country to actually get a venture capital management company license. In Malaysia, there are 22 license. Okay, we are the 90 company, got it. We actually also regulated equity crowdfunding. So uh, in Malaysia, there's six license, I'm also one of it. Okay, and then we actually regulated P2P lending as well. And then we actually have debt equity. Uh, there are a lot of banks are working on venture debt. So you see, we, uh, in Malaysia, we're actually expanding the equity financing option to several different areas. Not just about funding, not just about angels, not just about VC. Uh, and then now we are, as a license holder, we are also working very hard to push the SC and our income, income revenue. For any investment made into startup or equity funding, equity financing, we actually ask the government to give a tax relief to them, up to 300,000. This is what we, as a responsible person, trying to push to stimulate the investment, uh, equity investment thing. I think uh, understanding more alternative financing in the space will be good. And then we also uh, observe that there is a lot of corporate venture capital coming up. And then corporate escalator is coming up, which these are very good because corporate escalator works better because like I think uh, Guo Ping actually said, I think corporate escalator first, they give you a sandbox technology, especially those people who wanted to go into fintech. Fintech is a very close market. In, uh, very close end game thing but however if you are if bankers take initiative to open up their sandbox to allow the fintech startup to actually assess to their API assess to their environment I think that will really help more and then we start to see more corporate venture who actually investing into startup okay yes a few of them are my very good friend 
But I asked them, what's your end game? Do you know the accelerator actually is a money losing business? I'm not sure about you guys, but I think this has been one of the real challenge. So he told me, he's a listed company in Malaysia. He told me, Andrew, actually my end game is talent acquisition. I'm going to throw the 10 million for my R&D. Why not I just invest in all this startup? Hopefully one or two make it, and then I will just uh, secure the IP. If they don't make it, come and work for me. So that was actually uh, that kind of initiative we've been push, pushing in Malaysia as well. So I think it's actually something that you can actually look into it, into sandbox technology, getting more alternative financing options in the market. That would be really good because I think a lot of startup think that the only person I can speak to is VC. Actually, you have more than that. You could actually uh, take out a P2P lending, venture debt. You could actually go, your project can actually go for equity crowdfunding. There are a lot, and there are also a lot of super angel who might be around you, who are the industry expert who's going to help you. And then there is always, as a startup, you can, uh, in, there is always to us in funding, the first tier of funding is the 3F. The first thing is the friends, family, and then the fool. There must be some fool around you who, are, who will buy your idea and want to invest. I think uh, we should make the ecosystem uh, more complete by inviting different players as well to, uh, to complete the whole equation. Uh, yeah, the um, I'm into. Uh, I have uh, three network. I'm a member of three networks. One is with Japan. Uh, uh, the initiative is with the uh, to Tokyo University. They have a, a technology uh, exchange partnership program that's been ongoing for five years. And then the uh, Korean Hanhua Group uh, FinTech uh, Dream Plus uh, Alliance. Um, then also with the LACI in uh, Los, uh, Los Angeles. Um, this network, um, unfortunately, it didn't go very far. Uh, it has always been really like, uh, it's more ended up being that um, as, a, a, as a channel for the main organization to, a, to get access to startups and stuff like that, which is actually good. But the, the, it, it didn't go very far, in my um, humble opinion, is, has been that the cross-support um, among the other partners have been somewhat not there. Uh, like, I mean, like, uh, even with the uh, TEP or the, the, the Japanese Alliance kind of a th network, um, we will, as a member, we were more or less like, committed to help each other's uh, startups to get into each other's market uh, and so on and so forth. But the, somehow that didn't go very far because I think that it is always that the, uh, the understanding uh, as well as the, 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 the motivation is not quite there. Uh, it, the, it's not quite aligned among the, uh, within the members um, to, to how to make that work. So unfortunately, that didn't go too far. So the, uh, so far, it has been quite... Uh, the more... Uh, the one which I thought that is probably more of value is the one with the uh, Hong Kong Cyberport whereby through them, we get into, uh, we are also part of the uh, Essential Innovation, FinTech Innovation Lab uh, kind of initiative. So we send our startups there, but it's also because of the uniqueness of the FinTech industry, whereby in China, FinTech, uh, or rather the uh, capital, the finance sector is still relatively close. So therefore, uh, being with part of the alliance, that sort of like open the mind share or the mind mindset of uh, our startups in terms of what's uh, getting them well averse with the best practices in the, uh, in, the uh, in the global sectors and stuff like that. So there's a motivation uh, there, and for us to also get acquainted with some of the uh, startups in the similar front. But beyond that, uh, it is quite difficult for. Uh, I, I think that the challenge for AAN is really to establish how among the various members able to establish the understanding and also to to reach a certain um, uh, common mutual benefit kind of arrangement so that we could work not just with the organization but also among the uh, members. Yeah. Hello. I think uh, my great teacher, Professor Hank Huang, is doing a great job really, setting up all this. And uh, I also believe that he already has a great plan to, to develop and expanding the network. So uh, instead of 
talking about uh, my opinion or suggestions, I, 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 I would prefer to say my expectation from, from AAN. Okay. I would expect uh, this network um, is a network for all the accelerators in Asia so that uh, we can get together from time to time. Like, uh, I, I agree that we are all busy guys, okay? So uh, maybe half a year we can have some gathering. We talk about uh, the programs, how to improve our programs. We talk about uh, the, the trends of the investment. We can discuss about uh, what's the next big thing, okay? Although maybe some, some accelerators are, are competitors of each other, but actually we don't mind. And uh, uh, we hope that we can learn together, we can learn from each other, and we can improve ourselves in terms of a lot of uh, initiatives. And also, uh, I, would also I would like to, um, to join uh, some activities, maybe in Malaysia, in Singapore, in China, which is organized by AEN, so that I can go there and to know the accelerators there. I think um, it's a good idea, but uh, of course you need some funding to do that. So that's your problem, not us. Okay. <laughs> so that's what I want to say. Um, can't say much. Uh about the Taiwan ecosystem, because this is my first time for a second day in, uh, in Taiwan. Uh, <laughs> but also, uh, I can uh, already say that well, the people I met, uh, and uh, all the people I met with the AN, uh, especially yesterday, uh, it was imp very uh, impressive, the, the quality of the people, like um, this impression that, um, you know, sometimes with entrepreneurship, you have some uh, you have some bullshit and bullshitters, and I really feel that here and uh, thanks to uh, thanks to you, uh, you have um, a real vision, a real uh, quality uh, behind. So it's very interesting. And what the only thing that I can share is the thing that we believe at School Lab is that today uh, entrepreneurship um, gives a huge opportunity to to bring value. And to, and to give value to things that were thought by people as commodities. Uh, and sometimes certain parts of uh, hardware, for example, uh, were uh, um, seen as only commodities and the, uh, the cost was the only driver. And, uh, and today with the Internet of Things, as we have seen uh, in the presentation, with many things, there is a space to bring value by uh, re putting together software, hardware, customers, users, experiences, basically a huge solution. And uh, in a place like Taiwan, I think, has a really huge, uh, huge uh, potential to, uh, to go even better uh, in the future. So really hope that uh, this is not just the last time that I come to Taiwan. <laughs> OK, time's up. So I would like to thank all our panelists to share their, your experience to all our audience. And also I to thank our audience to stay here. And uh, it's almost 5.30. So let's finish it. And uh, thank you, you all. Thank you. <laughs>